Hi everyone, Lee here. I just wanted to point out a few important things from chapter one. It starts off with a lot of vocabulary. We have population, sample, parameter, and statistic. You can think of population as the large collection of things that you're really looking at, and the sample is the small piece um, of the population that you can actually sample. You can think of the population as a bowl of soup. The bites that you're taking represent the sample. And so if you're not taking a good representative um, of every little thing, all the carrots and the chicken and the noodles, you're not getting a very good sample. And so what you want to do is take randomly, random bites from this bowl of soup to get a good representation of what the whole taste of the soup is like. An example of where the sample is not representative of the population is looking at this headline right here, where Dewey defeats Truman. This was actually in 1948, and this was a large telephone poll. And actually, Harry S. Truman won the election. So this just wasn't representative of the whole population. However, in a different poll, back in 2008, um, 2,847 Americans were polled, and 52% of them supported Obama. Um, in the actual election, 53 voted for Obama, so this was actually a very good sample, and random sampling can be a very powerful tool great visual about the big picture of statistics. The reason we can't go directly to the population and start polling numbers is because it's just too big and it's constantly changing. And so what we have to do is we have to take a sample of that population. Once we get a really good um, representative sample, we can take start looking at the numerical statistics that come with it. We can look at the sample mean, we can look at standard deviation, we can actually take this and make some different really cool charts with it. This right here is a dot plot and it has to do with the world gross in millions of different movies. Here's an also representation of the same thing but here we have what's called a histogram. And next we've got a box of whisker plot. You're gonna see all of these in chapter two. Once we have our statistics then we can start looking at the parameters of the population. This step is called inferential statistics because we're kind of estimating at this point. It's important to point out here that the population data and the sample data have different ways that they're represented. Data can be sorted in two different ways. We have categorical versus quantitative. Categorical it also goes by the name of qualitative, but really it just has to do with categories. So you might think of the year, or gender, or maybe the type of award. But quantitative data comes with a number. So you might think SAT score, or the GPA, maybe the height, or the weight. So let's take a look at some interesting situations. Let's think about what are the variables, and is each variable categorical or quantitative? Number one. Can eating a yogurt a day cause you to lose weight? So let's think. These, my variables are yogurt, yes or no, and weight. Yogurt would be categorical, while weight would be numerical or quantitative. Number two, do males find females more attractive if they wear red? Our variables would be, well, it'd be attractive scale and wearing red. So attractive scale would be quantitative because it's numerical, but wearing red would be a yes or a no. Number three, does louder music cause people to drink more? Our variables would be the volume level versus the amount of beers drank. Volume level would be quantitative and the amount of beers drank would also be quantitative. Number four, are lions more likely to attack after a full moon? Variables, full moon and lion attack. Full moon would be a yes or a no. Lion attack would also be a yes or a no, which would be qualitative. The answer to all of these questions is yes. There have been studies done rigorously in all of these different areas. Here is an interesting study on knee surgery to cure arthritis. Researchers did a random study where some people got the surgery and some people didn't. Everyone who got the surgery reported feeling less pain. So is this enough evidence that surgery is actually helping to decrease the pain? And actually, it's not because what we really need to do is we need to have a control group so we could figure out what would happen without the surgery. The researchers then had a control group where they gave them a fake knee surgery. They cut them open, but the doctor didn't actually perform the surgery and all of these patients reported less pain. 
So the improvement was indistinguishable between those receiving the real surgery and those receiving the fake surgery. This is actually called the placebo effect. And if you want to hear more about it, take a look at the link I put on Canvas. So here are the sampling methods from chapter one. We have simple random sampling, which means that everyone in the population has the same chance of being selected. Systematic random sampling, where you might pick every fifth person that comes through the door to sample. Stratified random sampling is where you take the population, you divide it into groups or called stratas based on a characteristic. And then from there, what you would do is you would random sample each of those stratums. The clustered sampling is where you take the population, you divide it into clusters, and then you would randomly select a cluster. But the main idea is we would normally just use technology and that would give us a better sample of the population. The last type of sampling is called convenient sampling. This is the one that most people use because it's the easiest to do. The only thing you have to be careful about is, is it representative of the population or not? Within lab two, you're going to collect data about how many shoes people have in their closets. Then you're gonna use that data to create some statistics. Good luck.